get started. We understand that the security procedures have changed and that there may be hordes of people looking to come up here that are stuck downstairs. Uh, however, because the first part of these meetings are of general interest to almost nobody, we're going to go through and, you know, we're going to go and get through that portion. And if we get to substantive things and people still aren't upstairs, you know, we might take a quick break to allow people to, you know, pass through the security piece. All right, if you all would uh, rise and join us in a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I hope uh, members of the board have had an opportunity to uh, read and review the minutes of the September 18 and 19 meetings. Uh, if so, is there a motion to either approve them or to uh, amend them? <coughs> motion to approve and second from Dr. Paxton. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, uh, Dr. Pexton. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, the Board of Education is pleased to recognize five secondary mathematics and science teachers as the 2019 state level finalist for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. This program was established in 1983 by the White House and is administered by the National Science Foundation on behalf of the White House Office of Science and Technology. This program, this program identifies outstanding science and mathematics teachers in each state and the four United States jurisdictions. One year, the award goes to an outstanding kindergarten through grade six teacher, and the next year to an outstanding teacher in grade seven and 12 through 12. The program, the awardees serve as models for their colleagues and, their, and, and our leaders in the improvement of mathematics and science education. The 2019 Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching State Finalist Awardees for the Commonwealth of Virginia are, first, Kelly Drager, Kelly Drager is an outstanding seventh grade mathematics teacher at Mark Twain Middle School in Alexandria, Virginia. Kelly demonstrates mastery of the content and develops lessons, lesson plans that ensure all students are actively engaged. Students discuss content and collaborate to problem solve as she masterfully and intentionally facilitates the learning. She knows the needs of every child in her classroom and works tirelessly to meet those needs brings the love of learning mathematics to each lesson, and Kelly also serves as a mathematics teacher leader where she has often been called upon to lead curriculum teams, provide, provide professional development, and mentor others. Thank you. Congratulations. Our next awardee is Rebecca Hall. Rebecca is a reflective master teacher who provides high level instruction to Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 students in a blended learning setting at Code RVA Regional High School. Rebecca's passion for teaching and her commitment to serve students shine through in her student centered classroom. She is an experienced educator with a strong knowledge base of curriculum, instruction, and assessment that cuts across multiple grade levels. She is a thoughtful pra practitioner practitioner devoted to lifelong learning and an innovative teacher with a vision to educate students in the 21st century. Preparing students for a variety of future careers that involve mathematics and computer science. Congratulations, Rebecca.
Our next awardee is Aziz Zarawi. I apologize. <laughs> Aziz is a passionate, dedicated, and driven Virginia ed educator who is certified in both mathematics and computer science. He currently teaches geometry and advanced placement calculus at Churchland High School in Portsmouth, Virginia. He demonstrates mastery of the content he teaches and uses effective instructional methods and strategies to reach his students. Aziz is regularly thinking of ways to apply the mathematics he teaches to real world experience for students, including working with drones and sponsoring field trips to one of the local shipyards, which I hope was Newport New Shipbuilding where I work. <laughs> if it wasn't, then please come there next. He pushes his students to understand the depths of the content, not just the bare minimum. Aziz was selected as the Churchland High School Teacher of the Year during the 2016-17 school year. Congratulations. Our fourth awardee is Myron Blosser. Myron teaches teach, Myron Blosser's teaching career has included 34 years of instruction in the field of biology. He currently teaches at the Harrisonburg Governor STEM Academy, where he teaches honors classes in biology and biotechnology and serves as the supervisor of student research. Myron takes an innovative approach to instruction that is student-centered and cross-curricular in nature. His application video showed students that were engaged in the five C's as they conducted a gel electrophoresis. Did I get that right? Awesome. <laughs> they also used the science and engineering practices as they researched, designed, built prototypes both virtually using, both virtually and using cardboard, and finally constructed the actual electrophoresis units. Throughout the process, he supported students, yet provided opportunities for them to apply critical thinking, problem-solving skills when they experienced failures, utilizing those experiences as opportunities <coughs> to learn. Thank you very much. Our final awardee is Colin Bouchelon. Colin currently teaches environmental science, both the advanced placement and standard courses, as well as the advanced placement capstone course at Manassas Park High School. Colin believes that students should engage in a variety of learning experiences each time they enter a classroom. His lessons are designed to encourage student exploration of real world environmental issues and promote critical thinking as students engage in collecting data, analyzing results and determining consequences of environmental actions including those actions that were thought of as a means of conservation, but did not lead to the expected outcome. Colin believes that the backbone of a positive and supportive learning environment is to build real personal relationships with students in ways that validate their unique characteristics. That's awesome. So I'm gonna ask all of our awardees to please come forward. So please join me in congratulating these tremendous Virginia educators. You want to join us for a board picture? Thank you.
Congratulations again to all these exceptional teachers across our Commonwealth of Virginia. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to come before you today to tell everyone the board is honored to proclaim November 2019 as Family Engagement and Education Month in the Commonwealth. The board often acknowledges the critical role families play in the education of our youth, whether through parents, step parents, siblings, grandparents, adopted parents, or guardians, the support and active participation of families in our schools supports children's success in learning, and as they become protective citizens, contributing to our communities. Families provide children their first learning experiences and ensure that learning is a process that extends beyond the school doors and hours. Over 30 years of research clearly indicates all students achieve at higher levels when schools and families support each other. The Board of Education wholeheartedly supports the work of the department, school divisions, organizations such as the Parent Teacher Association and other partners that develop ideas, resources and training for stimulating and sustaining parental involvement. Family Engagement and Education Month is an opportunity to recognize the importance of families and schools and the work being done throughout the Commonwealth to ensure that we work together to build better futures for all children. The Virginia Board of Education and the Virginia Department of Education strongly encourages local school officials to develop plans and policies to enhance family engagement in their children's schools, lives, and in the education community. With us this morning to accept the resolution from the board is Tracy Lee, Family Engagement Specialist at the Department of Education. Tracy was recently recognized by Governor Northam for her personal and professional excellence in family engagement. Tracy provided leadership and guidance in development of the critical decision points for families of students with disabilities, the document and associated training curriculum are all her hard work. This document is an informational resource for parents of students with disabilities that includes a printed guide, web-based training modules, in-person training for families, and in-person train the trainer programs for school personnel and other stakeholders who work with families of students with educational disabilities. Through Tracy's efforts to ensure significant dissemination of the information in this resource, the VDOE has significantly, significantly expanded its outreach across the Commonwealth regarding special education processes, including the underserved areas of rural Virginia, our military families, and parents of students entering into preschool. Thank you to Tracy and all of our education partners for their work to strengthen our families, our schools, and our communities through parent and family involvement. photo. You can't come all this way and get a picture. So. <laughs> I just can't see cameras. <laughs> all this way upstairs. Oh, I forget the picture. <laughs> Okay, uh, we, the board will now begin its uh, public comment session. Uh, 
many of you, you know, I recognize we've been here before. Uh, you understand the process here, which is three minutes are allotted to each speaker. We would appreciate it to the extent possible you stay within that three minutes. It is the uh, custom of this board not to respond to individual uh, public comments. However, uh, we do have a tracking mechanism and staff will respond to any comments where appropriate. So uh, we will begin with uh, Dr. Scott Braybrand. Good morning. Good morning. Dear President Gecker, Board of Education members, and Dr. Lane, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for being champions for equity in public education in Virginia. Your revised standards of quality will help put an equity focus on our students and schools. I come today to ask for both a temporary and a permanent adjustment to your accountability structures to support equity and accountability. First, I'm asking for a temporary adjustment for Fort Belvoir Primary, which is an all-military family school. Your appeal process asks for evidence of a significant event impacting a school. An adjustment is needed for Fort Belvoir because last year's General Assembly decision to allow mil military families the opportunity to attend any school in a district when arriving in Virginia, regardless of accredited status, has had unintended consequences. We did not ask for an appeal for Fort Belvoir last year because this state law did not exist. We've hired a new veteran principal and we're already seeing real academic gains, including a 22 point increase in math. But the new state law combined with the school's accreditation status is sending the wrong message to those schools, military families who now have unlimited school choice. We ask that you change the accreditation of status of Fort Belvoir so we can complete the transformation of that school without this conditional label. Equity for the students, teachers, and the entire Fort Belvoir community supports this temporary adjustment. We also ask you to apply an equity lens to the non-academic dropout indicator for two of our schools, Justice at Mount Vernon High. The Board of Education is to be commended for shining a light on dropouts, and we share your desire to help meet the needs of all children. The Board currently has an 11 semester waiver for measures of academic achievement, but no such adjustments available for the non-academic dropout indicator. Can you imagine attending school in another country with low levels of literacy, learning another language, trying to find a job for your family? We should never label a student a dropout who's barely had the chance to drop in. The significant event impacting both these high schools and impacting dropout performance is the unprecedented growth of level one English language learners and students with interrupted formal education or SIF. The changing student demographics and characteristics of students at Justice High and Mount Vernon is a growing issue across the Commonwealth. The state doesn't even track SIFE at this time. We want to work with you, though, to transform how we provide high school education to the most challenged English language learners and SIFE kids. The accreditation rating for these two schools is not an indication of the quality of education or the supports this school district is giving to these students. In fact, last year's senior cohort at Justice, 58 students dropped out. 54 of them were level one English language learners. 24, almost half, were SIFE. 92% of the SIFE students at Justice dropped out last year. 100% of the SIFE kids at Mount Vernon dropped out last year. We ask for you to grant appeal to these three schools. Don't send the wrong message to our teachers, our students, and the communities that open their doors wide to serve these students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Maria Eck. Good morning. Good morning, President Gecker, Board of Education members, and Dr. Lane. 
Um, thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. I am Maria Eck, the principal at Justice. I also want to thank our school board members, Sandy Evans and Karen Corbett -Scart Sanders for being here this morning as well with us. I thank you for allowing me to speak to you today to appeal our level three designation for the new dropout rate school quality indicator. Dr. Lane, you had the opportunity to visit our school last year and witness firsthand the exceptional work we are doing with our students. As you can see from the data sheet provided, Justice has continuously improved the graduation rate as well as our SOL scores. While the dropout rate metric does not meet the, the threshold set by VDOE, the four-year trend data demonstrates a 29% change in the dropout rate and a level one designation in the graduation completion index. We know that our students who are at risk for dropping out are those who are 18 years old and over, are often here on their own and tend to drop out before reaching senior year due to other life commitments. As shown on chart two, many of our dropouts are new to the US with Justice High School being the first US school they attend and for many, they arrive to us after years of interrupted formal education. Our students represent unique conditions. The reality is that we have some of the most vulnerable populations in our state. The enrollment trends in recent years have significantly impacted our dropout performance. As a matter of fact, Dr. Lane, since your last visit on October 26, 2018, we have enrolled 244 English learners, 89% which are level one. Justice is not your typical Fairfax County High School, and frankly, we like it that way. To support our students who need them, us the most and mitigate the special challenges they faced, we have formulated innovative solutions, such as hired additional staff, including but not limited to ESOL counselors, on-time on -time graduation support staff, and an additional social worker. Collectively, along with our teachers, our administrators, and other key staff, we support the emotional and academic needs of students, many who are homeless, working jobs late at night, and getting up the next morning to come to school. We've changed our ESOL programming so that ESOL learners are sitting in classes that count towards graduation requirements beginning with ninth grade. We also provide opportunities for mentoring, career exploration, and instructional programs through the award of the VDOE High School Innovation Grants. We have an outstanding staff who have close achievement gaps in a challenging environment. We take every state possible to keep students connected to school, find alternative educational placements when appropriate, and reconnect students with their educational goals after they have dropped. Our teachers take to heart improving the life outcomes of our students through academic and social supports. With their Without the relief granted, this status will have a negative effect on the morale of our teachers, students, and community, and will undermine our efforts to improve our instructional practices, reaching all students. From our perspective, the accreditation with conditious status will penalize our great successes with students. It does not reflect the strides that we have made. Please grant this appeal due to the unique circumstances that warrant special consideration for the 2019 school year at Justice High School. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz Payne. Uh, President Gecker, Vice President Atkinson, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. Thank you for this opportunity to share information about the health standards of learning revision being presented to you today for first review. I am Liz Payne, Instructional Services Coordinator for Health, Family Life, and Physical Education with Fairfax County Public Schools. It has been my honor and privilege over the last eight months to serve as one of the project lead for this revision. We are grateful to the General Assembly and to you for your commitment to the health and well-being of all students. This support provided an opportunity to engage a variety of stakeholders and experts about the many health topics that are of concern in our communities, including mental health and the opioid and vaping crises. Over many months, face-to-face -face and electronic collaborations were held with a variety of professionals. We are grateful for their participation and ongoing engagement throughout the revision process. Their level of, of commitment was exemplified 
by several of the professionals coming to JMU and working with teachers during their review of the standards. With mental health experts, we were able to think more deeply about instruction for mental illness and challenges, and their guidance led to the inclusion of measurable social and emotional learning skills. It was also emphasized by our experts that we need to address the stigma associated with mental health. The inclusion of additional content, skills, and focus on accessing resources for help and assistance is essential to helping our students, families, and communities begin to address mental health concerns and reduce stigma. Behavioral health experts we met with helped us to understand issues and the many challenges associated with substance use and vaping and the importance of prevention. Their guidance has led to an articulated focus on substance use and uh, prevention to empower students to make healthy decisions. One of the most eye-opening collaborations was a meeting with members of the Governor's Opioid Task Force, including a physician, DEA agent, and federal prosecutors. They shared the real-world impacts of the opioid crisis and the many factors that influence the crisis and its victims. Their influence continues to expand as we have shared their availability to present Silent No More, a presentation they do on substance abuse for students and parents to further their knowledge about the opioid crisis. Dr. Sandy Kerwood, uh, Virginia Department of Education, Director of School Nutrition Programs and her team provided us feedback on standards for nutrition. When responding to community and teacher feedback, I went back to Dr. Kerwood to ask about how we might approach food allergies in the standards. She and her team went above and beyond with providing grade level specific standards for grades K through 10. Working with teachers from across the Commonwealth, we were able to focus on clear, articulated and explicit expectations for student learning. This included a change in format to present the standards by topic that provides clarity and transparency to students, parents, families and community members. We look forward to review and feedback as well as the additional community comments during this process to con continue to strengthen the health education stands of learning and to continue a commitment to educating the whole child. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mary Crozier. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Mary Crozier and I've been in the field of substance abuse prevention and intervention since 1979 for community services boards and behavioral health and the College of William & Mary until receiving my doctorate from William & Mary to begin teaching addictions counseling. Um, I, as a retired professor, I'm an officer on two substance abuse prevention coalitions, one in Virginia Beach and one statewide, which is how I met Vanessa Wiggins, who is uh, with the DOE, and Sheila Jones with the City of Virginia Beach um, Schools. They invited me to participate in the standards of learning revision process. And through that, I attended a planning meeting in Richmond, a three-day conference at JMU, and I gave lengthy online comments. So yes, I worked hard, I invested lots of time, but throughout the process, uh, both women and the whole review process team were very appreciative, um, very well organized, responsive, very respectful of my input. So um, throughout this time, I was using my textbooks, my expertise. I've served on the Governor's Opioid Commission, all my work with uh, statewide coalitions. So they welcomed that expertise and experience and used all my suggestions in these new standards of learning revisions. So those suggestions include information about new information, research about alcohol, opioid licit and illicit medications, um, substance abuse prevention strategies, family codependence, community enabling activities, marketing, and just that whole wealth of developmental prevention strategies that we know um, have efficacy. The standards of learning now, these revisions reflect a breadth of all this current and emerging research and in issues. We have a research-based content. We've uh, applied sensitivity to different developmental needs and we have some practical classroom applications. So it's been a pleasure for me to be on this review process with the DOE, and uh, I've been really enjoyed working with their whole team. So 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, let me just note, you know, occasionally I'm able to say doctor and Dr. Crozier, I did not say that with you. They give me the sheet of who's speaking and often they don't tell me you know, the uh, doctor versus not doctor. So there's no disrespect intended to those of you out there. Uh, Sheila Jones. Before, before you start the, the timer, I've, I also have a comment from a student. I asked him for a soundbite, and he literally emailed soundbites to me last night. So after I do my piece, if you'll indulge, it would just be like another few seconds sure. beyond my three minutes. Um, I understand, but he asked me to share it with you. So um, good morning, President Gecker, esteemed members of the board, Dr. Lane. Um, so nice to be in the same room with you all. <coughs> My name is Sheila Jones. I'm the K-12 Health and PE Coordinator, Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Um, not only has it been an honor to serve as one of the leads on this committee, it's also been life-changing for me. I've been on several SOL review committees. This one, bar none, most effective. Um, thanks to our colleague, Vanessa Wigan, her vision of collaborating with subject matter experts was unique. And to coin one of Vanessa's favorite phrases, Together we are better, and indeed we were. It, um, unlike any other content area, health education is unique in that when societal needle moves, so do the legislators. In response to the needs of the public, changes are legislated. The areas of social, emotional, and physical health are frequently impacted by the members of the Virginia General Assembly. As health educators, we're responsible for teaching our students to navigate a stress-filled world and live healthy lives. Most notably, <laughs> The legislative topics of late have been related to prescription drugs, opioids, vaping, and mental health. After meeting with experts in the field, it was clear that this effort takes more than the skill set of an educator. The health standards before you today are the result of the collective endeavors of educators, school administrators, school counselors, addiction specialists, attorneys, and even doctors. Together, we created health content that will help our students face challenges and give them skills for success. It took a combination of every one of our skill sets in the group to create the new standards, and we hope you're as pleased with the result as we are. In terms of the process, not only did we collect comments from stakeholders, but we honored the many perspectives. When you view all the change documents, you'll notice the attention to scaffolding of content and the move to introduce some of the more sensitive drug content at earlier grade levels. In some instances, we had to determine which comments to use. These decisions were primarily made through consensus as this document has been edited by many stakeholders over the past the last eight months. Finally, we made a very concerted effort to include relevant topics for students and provide a focus on health careers that were somewhat mirrored by the composition of our committee. Uh, as a society, we certainly need more substance abuse counselors, more public health experts, more life coaches, and certainly more health literate individuals. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we provided students with hands-on opportunities to use the skills learned in health education? There are so many relevant applications for critical thinking, student voice and choice, and advocacy. And speaking of advocacy, you have before you an article that was written by an Ocean Lakes High School student, Pierce Corson. It's about giving teens a voice, sources of stress for high school students. He cited the need for more health education about stress management and states the aim of our project was to create a survey that allows teens to have a voice in the conversation about revising the health SOL in response to the legislated areas and student reported stress and support factors. So now, if you will indulge me, I will play the little sound bite. As a high schooler, I've seen an immense amount of stress, both in myself and in my peers. I hope that my research will help the VDOE equip students like me with a more effective method of stress management. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dr. Keith Perrigan. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good morning, President Gecker, uh, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. My name is Keith Perrigan. I'm superintendent of Bristol, Virginia Public Schools. 
Let me start by thanking you <clears throat> for taking a proactive approach to serving our children. From embracing standardized testing reform and reimagining the SOQs to recommending an equity fund, the board and the department are changing public education in Virginia in a very meaningful way. You're putting students first and ensuring that Virginia is indeed for learners. It is that creative, innovative and equity mindset that led me to file an appeal with the Virginia Board of Education in regards to Virginia Middle School's accreditation status. Virginia Middle School last met the requirements for full or non-conditional accreditation in 2014. Since I started as superintendent in 2017, we've made purposeful decisions to reallocate resources and provide support to both Highland View Elementary and also to Virginia Middle School. That focus and the relentless work of teachers and students at both schools has led to increased student performance and solid gains in student learning. The perspiration, tears, and prayers that have been poured out over Virginia Middle School became increasingly poignant this fall when we learned that our in-house calculations, which would have led to non-conditional accreditation, were incorrect. We had wrongly assumed that student growth and recovery affected failure rate in the same way that they affect pass rate. Had our assumption been correct, Virginia Middle School would have reduced failure rate in English in the category of students with disability by 13% and would have avoided the with conditions designation. In fact, students with disabilities have increased pass rates in English at Virginia Middle School consistently over the last four years, going from 33% in 2016 to 51% in 2019. That is an 18% increase in just four years. We also realize there's still work to do, but to continue to wear the with conditions badge is not a fair representation of the progress our middle school has made. According to the current formula for calculating failure rate, the with conditions designation is correct. Our appeal is based on the fact that student growth and recovery are part of the pass rate calculation, but not part of the failure rate calculation. I would argue that the formula as it is, is contrary to the board's current philosophy of reforming standardized testing and accreditation in a common sense and equitable way. Student growth and recovery go hand in hand with reducing failure rate and the formula should acknowledge that nexus. Finally, this board nor this administration developed the current form, uh, failure rate formula. However, this board does have the authority to adjust and correct it. I respectfully request that you do just that on behalf of Virginia, the Virginia Middle School community and other schools, students, and teachers in our Commonwealth who have shown student growth, achieved academic recovery, and have, as a result, reduced failure rate by 10% or more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jason Matlock. Good morning, President Gecker, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. My name is Jason Matlock, and I'm the principal at Virginia Middle School in Bristol, Virginia Public Schools. Over the past several years, the students and teachers at Virginia <laughs> Middle School have worked extremely hard to help all of our students show academic growth. Stayed after school, came in before school, worked through lunch, doing whatever it takes to show achievement. We have made significant gains in many achievement areas. And we thought that we had finally cleared our last hurdle by meeting the requirements for full accreditation. To say that we were extremely disappointed when we received our preliminary accreditation report is an understatement. Dr. Perigen has already spoken about the formula discrepancy, so I will not elaborate any further on the percentages. However, I would like to put a face on how the formula discrepancy affects our students, our teachers, and our community. Last year, we had a number of students who had never passed an SOL before in their lives, finally able to celebrate in a way that they'd only seen other students celebrate for so many years. For so many who had never passed an SOL before, there were tears of joy from students, teachers, and parents because of the ability to measure growth as a means of passing. An eighth grade student with a learning disability told her English teacher, it doesn't matter whether I take it or not. I've never passed a reading SOL and I never will. Her teacher refused to let her settle, worked with her in class, increased her reading fluency through intervention, and breathed life into her every day. When the reading aid SOL rolled around, she showed enough growth to be counted as a pass. The student burst out crying tears of joy and hugged her teacher when she found out what her score was. For the first time, she experienced success because of the growth measure. And in her words, I finally felt like I wasn't a failure when the SOL scores came back for the first time in my life. This student falls within our subgroup in question. And if I had more time, I would gladly share many of the same stories about students just like this with the same outcome. With the current formula to measure the reduction in failure rate for subgroup performance, equal credit is not given 
to account for growth and recovery in both the pass rate and the failure rate. By not giving equal credit to both categories, it's essentially saying to these students, thank you for your effort, but since you didn't score 400, you don't really count. And I'm sure that this is not the intended message, but it is the one that is heard loud and clear by the students and teachers that it affects and work tirelessly every day. I also realize that this board did not create the formulas used to calculate the reduction in failure rate for subgroups. But I do know that you have the power to do something about it. With everything that you are doing to ensure that each student has an equitable chance, I implore you to uphold the R appeal so we can drop the with conditions label to our accreditation status. I heard Dr. Lane speak at the VASSP conference this summer, and I was struck by a quote I heard in his presentation. It said, equity is not an initiative. It is the lens through which we view all of our work. I appreciate all of Dr. Lane's efforts. I'm glad that we have him leading the way for our students every day. I feel like everyone on this board and everyone in this room embodies that quote. So today, I ask you to look through that lens when you make the decision for our students, the students who need it the most, our students with disabilities subgroup. Again, I thank you for everything that you do every day for the students of the Commonwealth of Virginia, which include my own two kids. Sorry. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I will note that with regard to the Bristol cases coming up later, Ms. Davis Vaught has indicated that she will recuse. However, there's no reason to do that during the public session. Okay, uh, Jim Livingston. Good morning, President Gecker, <clears throat> excuse me, members of the board, Dr. Lane. I'm Jim Livingston, proudly serving as president of the Virginia Education Association. As many of you know, VEA has been working for years to seek a revision to the teacher evaluation model that we use currently in Virginia. We have long held that the current model's focus on student academic progress has had the unintended consequence of reinforcing the high stakes nature of our standardized student assessments and, as some recent research indicates, driving teachers away from the profession. In 2012, in response to federal reporting requirements of the State Fiscal uh, Stabilization Fund and to meet requirements of Virginia's Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 Flexibility Plan, Virginia was required to ensure that student academic progress accounted for 40% of the summative evaluation for teachers. Members of the VEA who served on the work group that were forced to accept those requirements back in 2012 expressed their concern that this new model would not serve students or our profession well. I am pleased that this board is considering revisions to the requirements that local school divisions can develop real structures to support student achievement while also using the evaluation to support teachers' professional growth. I am certain that in the next few weeks, you will hear much more from our members across the Commonwealth in support of the proposed revisions. Today, I ask you to support the proposed revisions to the guidelines for uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers, principals, and superintendents. And the VEA thanks you for taking up this important issue. Also today, you have the revisions <coughs> to the standards of quality on final review. The VEA appreciates all of the work this board has done to increase the state supported resources in our public schools, especially those that are focused towards our most at-risk students. As you know, we support all the proposed revisions, but do ask that you, once again, consider the language we have submitted on some of the proposals. I have provided copies of our proposed language for you again this morning. Again, I want to thank President Gecker, the members of the board, and Dr. Lane for the effective partnership I believe we have built and for the continued good work that we will do together for all of Virginia's public school students. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ashley Everett Arrington. Okay, uh, Becky Bowers Lanier.
Good morning, Mr. President, Dr. Lane, and members of the board. I'm Becky Bowers on the air, and I'm a contract lobbyist, advocacy consultant for several health-related advocacy organizations, including the Virginia Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance, the Virginia Association of School Nurses, the Virginia Counselors Association, the Virginia Association of Community Services Boards, the Substance Abuse Addiction Recovery Alliance, and the Virginia Association of Addiction Professionals. I'm here today not representing each of these organizations, but as a representative of the stakeholder group I put to, that helped to put together the Department of Ed, helped put together by the Department of Education to advise on the revision of the health education SOLs and to support the first review. The past several years, I've been observing and supporting the curricular and cultural integration of the five C's informing the profile of the Virginia graduate. And I thought for some time that individual student health and well-being were foundational to the five C's. I'm heartened that these proposed SOL changes, if fully implemented, will help our students become integrated and healthfully functioning members of society. The proposed revisions take into account what the document calls scaffolding health skills, which I believe reflects the developmental journey of young people as they grow to make helpful decisions and to understand the integration of physical, mental, social, and emotional health. In my consulting role with organizations involved in addiction prevention and recovery, I'm grateful for the emphasis on supportive healthy de decision-making for our young people about addiction as well as reducing the stigma associated with mental illness and substance use disorder. I would recommend that all educators and policy, educational policymakers work into integrating this content throughout each year of the K-12 experience. The educational, the advisory ed stakeholder group noted that grade 10 was deemed the last year for health education. We need to figure out ways that each year of the K-12 experience includes building on the scaffold of health, healthy behaviors. Thank you. Uh, Beth Tolley. Hi. Good morning. Good morning to you all. You've seen me before. Today I'm here for, um, as a member of the NAMI uh, Virginia board and I'm um, speaking for the board, but also I'm a parent of kids and um, grandkids with mental illness, including a son who took his life when he was 15. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the board and staff of NAMI Virginia, and I um, want to, for the staff and board, express my great appreciation, their great appreciation of being a part of the group um, work together with so many other people that were here um, to, to recommend the health con the mental health content for the health standards of learning. Uh, public education to reduce the stigma that surrounds mental illness and the improvement of the quality of life for individuals and families affected by mental illness are key parts of the NAMI mission. And I assume people know what NAMI means. Uh, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we strongly believe that the earlier children are introduced to the concepts of mental and emotional health in age-appropriate ways, of course, um, the better. Improving children's understanding of mental health conditions should help reduce the stigma. Um, it's all, also, as children understand these concepts, it's easier for them to um, ask questions. And as they are able to ask, as they have concerns, and as, um, as some of you may be familiar with Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson, um, if you name it, uh, you can tame it, um, they'll, they can talk about these things. And when you can talk about them, um, you reduce the stigma you um, you can it reduces the possibility of bullying. It also allows you it normalizes it. When you normalize things, it makes it much less likely to for things to bubble up and and get worse. So I am so thrilled personally, and Nami and staff are so pleased that these the DOE. It wasn't legislated. Uh, we're so grateful that the DOE decided and the board to include these as part of the 
on standards of learning, I think is a, a great thing for Virginia, for Virginia's children. So thank you so much. Um, with more openness about this, I think it, it will be so good for the, for the people of Virginia. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go back for a second. Is Ashley Arrington here? We're still stuck in security downstairs. Okay. Uh, that concludes the list of people who have signed up in advance, but as is our practice, if there's anybody else in the audience who would like to address the board, uh, please come forward. Good Thank morning. you very much. Um, I'm Sandy Evans. I'm the school board member for Mason District in Fairfax County. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, continue to address uh, you. I appreciate um, that uh, Dr. Braybrand laid the groundwork and Principal Eck uh, gave you an ex excellent example um, of what uh, Justice High School, what kind of a school it is. I wanted to emphasize here uh, what I consider the most important point to be made about the unique and special circumstances of Justice High School. This is a school that has seen a huge influx of newcomer students. Uh, many of them with very little formal education from their home countries. Uh, many of them who come to us at the age of 16 or 17. Of uh, 58 dropouts, uh, we're talking about the dropout rate in this case, of 58 dropouts at Justice High School, 54 of them are English language learners. And 24 of them were what we call SIPE students. The Justice High School dropout rate for ELLs was 24.2%, and that's not a great percentage. However, it is better than the state average for ELLs, which is 25.8%. So my point to you today is I hope that we will not penalize Justice High School simply because it has very large numbers of English language learners and, some, and most of them at EL1 levels. So rather than penalizing them when they, um, they create miracles every day there. So I would ask you to please grant our appeal. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Yes, thank you very much, uh, President Gecker, other members of the board, as well as Dr. Lane. My name is Karen Corbett Sanders, and I have the pleasure of representing the Mount Vernon Magisterial District on the Fairfax County School Board, as well as being this year's chair. I wanted to bring your attention to a phenomena that is happening in our district, in particular in the Mount Vernon region, as well as in the Mason District region. And that is about the availability of affordable housing. You want a triggering event? Well, what has happened in both of these areas is that because of the lack of affordable housing, market-based affordable housing in neighboring jurisdictions, actually a significant decrease in them, we have had a significant influx of uh, newcomers to our region, specifically the SIF students. And these students come to us with very few ties to the community in which they are attending school. And as they face increased affordable housing security or housing security and employment security, they are more inclined to go elsewhere. And what you find is that these are students who come in, have, um, are given a wonderful opportunity, and then because of other competing pressures, they have to, they find other places to go, and we do, they drop out of our schools. This is a particularly important, as I mentioned, because of the region in which I serve. Um, but I beg you to please grant the appeals before you so that we do not inadvertently label a community or a school because of its inclusive nature. And when we talk about equity, we need to ensure that we send the positive message about equity, about those communities that want to be inclusive and supportive of all students. So I ask for you to have a real equity indicator um, before we label our schools because we do not want to send a negative message to the community, to the teachers, and to the students that attend those schools. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to speak to the board? If not, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, thanks to everybody who came and spoke. And we will move on to the consent agenda. I guess we need to, uh, we can approve the consent agenda except as it references George Mason for the moment uh, to allow Ms. Holton to vote on that, which I guess item I, D. I think it's item D and I'll just recuse as to all of item D. I think that's easier for staff. Okay. And I, am I right that I am, uh, Mason is not in the item E, right? I don't think so. I, was trying right. to I think I'm was just D. Right. And you are just E? That's correct. All right, so let's pull D and E from the consent agenda first, and then we'll go back and... Pa Patty may be able to... George Mason is in both items. Both. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. So does that give you, if that, right. if that gives you a quorum problem, we can, we can recuse just as to what we need to recuse that, but it might be easier for staff if we just rec recuse us to the entire item. Um, enough, I await your guidance. To do it. So let's go ahead and let's approve if that's okay, or have a motion to approve uh, consent agenda items A through C. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Okay. Let's do uh, item D without the reference to Mason first. Uh, okay. If you want to vote on that, or if you want Happy to just, yeah, let's do item D without the reference to Mason. Is there a motion? A second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, let's do item D for Mason. So Ms. Holton will recuse. recuse. Uh, is there a motion to do that? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Item E uh, without Mason and you are? Is there a motion? So moved. It's motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then item E uh, for Mason and you are? Recuse. Is there a motion though? So moved. I'm sorry, I missed it if there was one. Uh, and staff has got to actually hear because they'll play the tape back and try to figure out who did it. So motion by Ms. Atkinson, second by Ms. Davis Vaughn. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that covers, I think, the consent agenda in as convoluted a fashion as we could possibly do it. Okay, uh, on to the action and discussion items. Uh, item F, final review of the revisions to the standards of quality. Good morning, President Gacker, Dr. Lane, members of the board. Uh, following on yesterday's discussion with council, um, staff has prepared a resolution for your consideration to prescribe the standards of quality, which Emily is passing around right now, along with a um, copy of the uh, complete set of standards um, that you'll uh, be prescribing today, hopefully be prescribing. Um, this resolution addresses the history of the SOQ from its inception in 1972, and it highlights how the 1984 codification of the SOQs um, has impacted the board's ability to fulfill its constitutional authority to prescribe SOQs uh, by way of inserting it into the Code of Virginia. Um, this resolution also points out that since 1988, the General Assembly has passed nearly 200 bills amending the SOQ, uh, the overwhelming majority of which have been unrelated to the board's prescribed SOQs. Um, the preamble also includes an, an acknowledgement that the board will include its pres prescribed changes in its annual report and submit budget estimates for consideration as stipulated by state law. Uh, and it also discusses the review process that you followed over the last year, um, as well as the stakeholder engagement and um, discusses how the board has used um, uh, the comp its comprehensive plan and uh, research-based best practices to inform these recommendations. So then when you get to the now, now, now therefore be it re re uh, resolved section, uh, the, the resolution by reference adopts the SOQ document, which has been passed around to you. And further, because some of the SOQ recommendations um, are not embodied within the SOQ, um, this resolution further requests that the General Assembly eliminate the Appropriation Act savings strategies that were put in place during the recession, um, better known as the support cap and the flexibility provisions. And further, the other request that's not embodied in the SOQ, um, the resolution requests VDOE work to improve its data collection processes 
uh, to gather information from school divisions about prevailing practices to help better inform the board's future SFQ recommendations. And with that, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, any are there any questions? Can we have like two or three minutes? Yeah, we can have a resolution? few minutes. We can read the resolution. That would be okay. But, uh, you know, Zach, if we're not going to, I mean, if the elimination of the support cap is not in the SOQs when it comes time to doing the budget estimate, I guess it would not be fair to include that number in the SOQ impact number. I, I that, that sounds appropriate. Okay, has everybody had a chance to read the resolution? Reading still. Okay. Uh, can we have an opportunity to discuss the language? Absolutely. Now the time. Now is the time. Uh, I would. Uh, you all have done a great job, uh, overnight work on this. Uh, in the third, whereas uh, the significantly infringing language is troubling me. I'm trying to figure out a version that can be simply as factual as necessary without trying to put any yes, we actually color had a, commentary a on it. We stage discussion with that. council. We did, because it, it, it first read eliminating, and it didn't eliminate the method by which the board um, prescribed standards of quality. It infringed upon it, it restricted it, it changed it. So but, this was a this morning change, and well, I am responsible you know, we, for it. I, we, do I don't take think forward. that. I mean, as the as a matter of law, the General Assembly cannot um, undo our constitutional duty, and and uh, they, they, because the Constitution but, is the Constitution. Right. So uh, you know, potentially or um, imp or impinging upon, or maybe just get rid of the. Yeah, get rid of significant. I would suggest get rid of significantly, um, and then potentially impinging upon or something. I don't know. You, you see what I'm? My, my concern is no, my concern is twofold. I don't want to put unnecessary commentary. I'm sure it wasn't any. What the General Assembly did, I'm sure, was not with any in, ill intent. Uh, effectively, maybe. Ah, that's a that's. And, and that's then, brilliant. and then, I also think the second piece is that they. they as I say, I mean, they, they cannot um, uh, uh, undo our constitutional duty. So, um, No, but I will say that that action did infringe upon your ability to fulfill your constitutional duty. And I think that was the point of the original language right. that Zach had put in there, which was eliminate the method by which you were previously, the board back then was previously able to prescribe the standards. What was your word? Effectively infringing. Effectively, uh, that's much effectively better. Effectively impacting, perhaps Would that work for people. Limiting. Well, because no, they can't limit. They can try to limit, but but, they, but if you read the rest of the sentence, it's they not that they lim, it's, even if they purport to limit, it does not limit because the Constitution right. trumps. No, I understand but that. But if you read the rest here? of the sentence, it's uh, limiting their ability, your ability to fulfill it, not not limiting your constitutional authority limiting your ability to fulfill your constitutional duty. 
what's the effort here, in my view, is to set out a roadmap for why we are where we are to people who have grown up generationally with a different system. And, I guess and you know, part of that roadmap is that you know, the belief that in 84, the actions taken did in fact infringe upon uh, the ability of the board to fulfill our constitutional duty. I understand that as a legal matter, uh, they can't. However, you know, whether it does, has or hasn't, has not been tested, nobody's pushed it. And in order to provide the backdrop for why we're going, you know, this way as opposed to the statutorily prescribed recommendation way, uh, that's why this is in here. I'm just trying to figure, out, you know, not not to um, no unnecessary them, them's kind of fighting words, and I don't think we mean it to be. Um, um, and so, effectively impacting make would that uh, convey the necessary intent without. Would we lose anything that way? I would go with effectively impacting the Board of Education's ability. Again, to me, the importance of the paragraph is the historical reference as to where the change in course occurred. Uh, the impact of all this will be decided by people other than us. Are we content with effectively impacting the boards? So take out a, a pawn and say impacting. Uh, that works for me, um, um, and I have not finished reading the rest of it. This I'm good with the rest of it. Okay. All right. Any other changes or proposed changes? Nope. Okay. Then um, is there a motion to adopt the resolution, which I guess effectively adopts the uh, SOQs? Is there a second? second. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, any discussion on this? Uh, uh, Kim Atkins did send a statement that she would like read, which I'll do now. Uh, it is with much regret that I'm unable to attend this important meeting, oh, excuse me, this important Board of Education meeting where I would have been in a position to demonstrate publicly my support for the proposed revisions to the standards of quality. In my view, this highly anticipated action will become a turning point for the Board where, we'll, where we will have made it undeniably clear that the Commonwealth of Virginia has a legal and moral responsibility to advance equity by first and foremost establishing at the state level the resources required to support fully a system of quality education for all students. Proposed uses of these required resources as presented in the standards of quality were based on one, evidence, and two, in consultation with renowned experts in the field of education and many statewide stakeholders, and three, input from the public at large. I further support the board's use of its constitutional authority to present the standards of quality to the General Assembly. Okay. Uh, Any President other Gecker, we we do believe that you sh the proper procedure should be to adopt the revisions to the standards of quality and then adopt the resolution. Okay. Then is there a motion? We'll take back the old one if that's okay. Withdraw that and let's go ahead. And is there a motion to adopt or to pres to prescribe, prescribe? I guess is the correct phrase. The standards of quality. Okay. Moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And then secondarily, I guess, we have the resolution prescribing the standards of quality for public schools in Virginia uh, as, you know, seen by the board with the changes in paragraph three of significantly infringing upon the Board of Education's ability to become effectively uh, impacting the board's of it, Board of Education's ability to fulfill, et cetera. Is there a motion to adopt that resolution? So moved. Moved here and seconded there. Thank you so much. Is there uh, any discussion on this? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
any abstentions? Okay, you know, I know we have a, a lot of work to do today. Um, and it's very rare that I comment on anything that the board does up here, but if the board would just indulge me for a minute. Yeah, we are approaching the 150th anniversary of constitutionally mandated public, uh, free public education in the Commonwealth. In the early days of the uh, you know, Commonwealth, the purpose of education was believed to be you know, important for the perpetuation of a free government, civic purpose, maximizing the personal development of people in the Commonwealth, so that individual purpose. And more recently, the General Assembly has declared education is important to the economic health of the Commonwealth. The 1971 Constitution speaks clearly to the role of the board uh, in the K-12 system and requires that we, the board, prescribe from time to time standards of quality. The 71 Constitution is the first time that standards of quality are referenced. You know, this board certainly recognizes the ultimate authority of the General Assembly over the standards, but believe our constitutional role includes primary responsibility and authority for effectuating educational policy in the Commonwealth. Uh, these standards were not arrived at lightly. Uh, two years ago, actually almost fully two years ago, in November of 17, uh, this board adopted a reasonably aggressive work program and reasonably targeted work program as uh, you know, outlined in the comprehensive work plan for the board. That program has three topics, you know, which you've heard us reference a number of times now. First was equity, is equity. Second was uh, teacher and building leadership. And the third, which is not yet addressed by this board, is uh, a review of the standards of accreditation. In order to begin that work, uh, we formed the Committee on Evidence-Based Policymaking, chaired by Kim Atkins, and took the time to, and followed where the evidence led. The SOQs we prescribe today are the result of the work of that committee, uh, staff, and I will say that without the uh, staff, we would be nowhere. Uh, so, Zach, thank you so much. You know. I can't tell you how hard it was every time you came with, up with a draft to tell you, well, we just want to make this slight change here, and we got a little bit of change of direction there. And Emily, who, of course, has done everything for this board and, you know, really made this uh, happen. The leadership of the Department of Education, you know, in particular, of course, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, James Lane, uh, and again, without whom we would not be here because he allowed the resources of the department to be dedicated to this particular task. The input of the stakeholders, you know, VEA has been with us. We've been around the state. Uh, the public has weighed in, as have a number of the superintendents uh, and, of course, the in individual board members. I am you know, sorry that Kim couldn't be here to, for this uh, and also, frankly, uh, miss the input of Elizabeth Lodel, who had tremendous impact on where we've headed, and Sal Romero, both of whom, I guess, predate this particular board but had important things to say about where we were going with regard to equity. You know, the equity challenges the Commonwealth faces and frankly the country faces are not going away anytime soon. Uh, they've been recognized by the General Assembly in, the, in this Commonwealth since the 1930s when the first steps were taken to provide additional funding to provide the resources that were needed to equalize it, you know, outcome of education. What this is today is an effort to assist those children who need it most so that they have the same opportunity for a positive outcome as any other child in the Commonwealth. You know, uh, we get talked about, and if you read the paper today, you know, mentioned as this is just about the money, but the SOQs are not really about increasing the resources going, although they will have that impact, or frankly, the allocation of those resources. You know, from my perspective, and I guess, you know, and I hope from the board's perspective, the SOQs represent a clear change in focus. Uh, that is, as we've talked about many times, that teachers matter. The SOQs clearly highlight the importing the right teacher in the right classroom. And also they acknowledge that <coughs> younger and less experienced teachers need time to hone their craft and they need the uh, input and mentorship of older teachers and others uh, to be able to do that. You know, we have m noted many times the teacher shortage in Virginia. And I can tell you, if you look at the numbers, if we were able to retain more teachers, we would significantly cut into uh, that teacher short shortage. Uh, these SOQs, by providing a career path for excellent teachers that lead somewhere other than school administration, and also by providing a unified system of mentorship uh, and coaching begin to accomplish, I think, 
our goal of uplifting the teaching profession and making sure that every young teacher has got uh, the time to hone their craft and to do this the best way possible. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you for doing this. Uh, this has really been a, a great thing, I think, for the Commonwealth and a great thing for this board. And I appreciate your willingness to uh, step forward in this fashion. So that's it. And we will now move on to before you move on, I think uh, I know Ms. Holton has something, and, and I'd uh -oh. like to also, uh, if you don't mind. Remember, President you're Kevin. limited to three minutes. And <clears throat> this is not public <laughs> comment. <clears throat> um, uh, Mr. Gecker, I'd like to just acknowledge your leadership on this process. You are so quick to uh, hold everyone else up for the work that's been done, and certainly we echo that. But it is your leadership that has challenged us as board members uh, pushed us to think differently and beyond what is to what could be. And um, I will note that uh, you often say, uh, I am not the educator in the group, whereas uh, <laughs> not the educator. Um, all of us are teachers at heart. Uh, and that teaching comes through the example that we set. And whether or not you've been through a teacher preparation program like those we've just approved today, uh, you, in fact, are an educator. You have a heart for the children of this Commonwealth. And we certainly, as a board and as um, a community, are certainly the beneficiaries of that. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for keeping under three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I, I, I won't repeat her um, uh, gratitude statement of gratitude to you. I will uh, add uh, to your comment, uh, uh, my gratitude to Zach and Emily, and Dr. Lane, your entire team for uh, coming along with us uh, in this process and for the public. The public input has been vigorous and we've been very grateful. When we, 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 we are meeting our constitutional mandate here to prescribe standards of quality for what is really needed for our students and we recognize that our standards have fallen behind the reality in a significant way. Uh, that's reflected in the fact that the, the so many localities have stepped up to the plate and been providing resources and quality education well beyond what's mandated by the state, but what has been mandated by us in the past, and uh, and we and yet we've been leaving behind uh, uh, some localities that for whatever reason have not been able to go beyond. Uh, the, the mandated standards. We are now really in many ways catching up the mandated standards with the, the true um, um, minimums recognized in the, in the field and, and particularly helping catch them up for those communities uh, that, uh, th and those students who, who the most need uh, a quality education as a trampoline to life success. So uh, I, I feel like our, our equity uh, lens uh, compels this action today and I'm grateful to everybody's leadership in helping us get there. Okay. okay. Yes, you may. So I'm going to go in a little different vein. I think I'm especially proud of the fact that uh, what has led us to this point is the research that we have done. And, and you know, you mentioned that we are all educators at heart. I want to challenge each member of this board to become that educator as this goes forward so that we can help the General Assembly understand the basis for which we have put together this proposal. We really have done the work to establish that the best way to move the needle for our children is to put an effective teacher in front of them. And how to accomplish that is what we have done through these changes to the standards of quality. Um, I, I, you know, I've been in the education field for a long time. And, you know, I used to say that I used to sit up and look out over areas where I knew students were not getting the opportunity. I am so proud of what we have done today because it, if even a portion of this gets funded, I think we will have made a significant difference in the lives of our children. So kudos to each of us, but we have still have work to do because we need to move it forward. Okay. And we need to get through item R on the agenda. So uh, <laughs> let me also... Just before we, we leave that, though, Susan, uh, 
you know, a lot of things that went behind the scenes here, just so people understand, is the long, lengthy discussions between our legal counsel, Susan Williams, and the board to uh, show the path for how we could do this in the way that it's been done. So thank you so much for your help there. Thank you. I was happy to be part. Okay, item G. Final review of guidelines for a senior capstone uh, project. Good morning, President Gecker, members of the board, Dr. Lane. After first review in September, we convened a group of stakeholders on September 25th to discuss the first draft of the capstone guidelines. There were 18 stakeholders out of 40 who were in attendance. Stakeholders included local school divisions, including teachers and division leaders, higher education, educational organizations, and people from business and industry. General feedback from the, the meeting included overall clarity of presentation and organization of the guidelines, clarity on how Virginia defines requested removal of the requirement of a written research project, identifying steps necessary to implementation. It is also important to note the overall concerns of a possible requirement for a senior capstone was mentioned. The concerns related to the amount of professional development our teachers would need to have and the potential of this becoming an unfunded mandate. After the meeting concluded, we had met and based on feedback, we had revised the capstone guidelines to include the following. More clarity to language surrounding what is a senior capstone. Pronounced headings, creating sections within the guidelines. Added clarity to help divisions understand there are four types of senior capstones students or schools may choose from. A suggestion for when capstones may be required for students recommendations for implementation, and overall examples included at the end. The new capstone revisions provided in front of you meet the recommendations of our stakeholders while meeting the spirit of the legislation. Do you have any questions for us? Dr. Wilson. Thank you all for your work and for uh, going back and incorporating uh, the suggestions and uh, rec referencing the concerns you found, I heard you talk about professional development and um, what would be the response to professional develop the concern in the field about professional development uh, for this particular item? If it passes this time around, we would have a tiered approach to the implementation of the capstones. They wouldn't be the next year. And we're hopeful we would see that there would be a tiered approach that would allow for professional development plans from the agency, from our educational organizations, and also from divisions to help roll it out a little bit more smoothly. And so is the department considering um, uh, supporting or facilitating that those collaborations and conversations across um, divisions and organizations and agencies? Absolutely, we would support. Mm -hmm. And again, the guidelines provided so much flexibility. <laughs> And um, if passed through legislation, we would sit down with stakeholders, a bigger stakeholder group, have a little bit more time to sit down and then discuss what implementation may look like. A little bit more strategic. Ms. Atkinson. Um, if I understand, first of all, I want to um, say how, how wonderful the changes you have made to this document are, and I appreciate the work that went into uh, making those changes. I think it's a, a, a stronger document for, for that work. Um, as, as a board, I think we are supposed to be forwarding these guidelines to the General Assembly. And you're referencing legislation that might pass again. Can, as a board, can we take a stand as to whether we believe that a capstone should be a, a statewide requirement or whether it should be um, up to the localities to determine whether or not to implement a capstone requirement for their students? I personally think that we should communicate that information. We have the opportunity since we have provided these guidelines to say where we stand in that regard. Um, you know, I, I, 
I remember when we were doing the work on the profile of a Virginia graduate and the it question of a capstone came up, we, we looked at that, that question and determined at that time that to do it statewide, what the, first of all, it was expensive, but also we weren't sure that that was necessary. We recognized that some of our divisions already had capstone requirements and felt that the best way to accomplish that was to allow it to be local decision. Um, I don't know where the board stands at this point, but I would um, hope that maybe we would take a position um, and communicate that to the General Assembly. Any other comments? I will say I agree with Ms. Atkinson that it is, uh, particularly given the way this came to us, sort of, uh, you know, do some regs, but or guidelines, but we may not actually need them if this doesn't pass this session. I think it's particularly appropriate for us to take a position if we desire to. So, and if we do that, perhaps President Gecker, we may reference the work based learning coordinators that we have included in the draft SOQs, just mm -hmm. approved for you. Okay, so let's take this in uh, two pieces. You, I guess you are looking for us to approve the guidelines, and that's all. Uh, and then secondarily, I guess we can talk about whether to take a position with the transmittal. So let's go ahead with the uh, first motion. Is there a motion to adopt these guidelines uh, for the purpose of transmission to the General Assembly as required by the statute? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And second now, uh, is there a desire to attach to said transmittal uh, a position of the board? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and what would that position be? <laughs> well, I think Ms. Atkinson... Um, uh, crafted some language in her comments. And so, sure. Diane, would you mind uh, rephrasing? <laughs> I guess what I was really asking was, did, did Ms. Atkinson's comments reflect the sentiment of the entire board? I'm supportive of the sentiment that she expressed. Absolutely. I thought the point that was made about local flexibility around this, given that some folk may already be doing this, is important. To okay. Anybody else? Okay, uh, so perhaps there could be a motion to authorize me on behalf of the board to uh, attach a transmittal letter with these that uh, take the position outlined in Ms. Atkinson's comments. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Atkinson. That was easy and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Item H, let me ask you this. Does the board want to break or is the board okay at the moment? I'm okay at the moment. Okay. Okay. okay so Item H. Good morning. Good morning. President Gecker, members of the board, Dr. Ling, Superintendent of, of Instruction. Senate Bill 1245 of the 2018 General Assembly requires the Board of Education to amend the 2009 standards of learning for economics and personal finance to include evaluating economic value of post-secondary <clears throat> studies, including the net cost of attendance, potential student loan debt, potential earnings in the board's objectives for economics and personal finance. Superintendent's memo 143-19 June 21, 2019, informed the general public and interested stakeholders of the General Assembly's request for the Board of Education to amend the economics and personal finance standards. A 30-day public comment period was provided for input on the process. On September the 16th, a work group comp comprised of 28 representatives, uh, including the State Council of Higher Ed Education for Virginia, Virginia 529 Plan, Junior Achievement, Federal Reserve Bank, and other financial and relevant organizations, educators, 
and administrators convened to revise the standards. The work group conducted an intense review with emphasis on the purpose of the free application for federal student loan aid, the FAFSA, in determining equability, describing the types of, of grants, scholarships, and loans, and potential scams associated with each type of aid, maintaining equitable equability after awards are received, identifying and repayments repayment requirements and options and describing the benefits and eligibility requirements and tax implications of state-sponsored tax advantage qualified to to tuition plans as investment options for post-secondary education e.g. Virginia's 529 plan. All requirements of Senate Bill 1245 were addressed in the review process that took place on September the 16th. Judy Sams, the program specialist for Biz business and information technology will provide additional specific comments about the workaround FASA and other significant changes. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Economics and Personal Finance <laughs> Standard 18 on page five of the attachment B that you have completely addresses the amendments identified by Senate Bill 1245. This standard emphasizes the importance of the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA in determining eligibility for grants, scholarships, and loans, and the essential information that is needed to complete this successfully. This newly developed standard will guide the instruction centered around post-secondary education and training that will include identifying costs and benefits of post-secondary education, sources and types of post-secondary education funding, and the differences between grants and scholarships and loans and maintaining eligibility for financial aid, all starting with the completion of this important FAFSA form. Okay. Are there questions? The board have any questions? Okay, so we will accept this on first review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, item I, first review of proposed revisions to the Career and Technical Education Work-Based Learning Guide. The 2019 General Assembly through House Bill 2018 and Senate Bill 1434 requires the Board of Education to revise the existing career and technical education work-based learning guide to expand opportunities available to students and allow greater local flexibility to meet the needs of both industry, business, and local school divisions. Two, two stakeholder meetings were convened on July 11th and September 12th, comprised of representatives from business and industry, community colleges, school divisions across the state. As a result of these work sessions, requirements were simplified, documentation was streamlined, and a standard measure of hours and credit was defined across the various work-based learning methods. Time requirements have been standardized to, uh, to allow more students to undertake the complete <coughs> work-based learning experience within a reasonable time frame without sacrificing rigor. 
Sharon Acuff, marketing specialist, <coughs> will review the, nav the 11 instructional methods. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As we review the CTE work-based learning experiences, I will reference the appropriate page in the boilerplate attachment that you have. Job shadowing on page 13 allows a student to learn more about career and workplaces as well as education required for the career. The experience can be in person, virtual, a one-on-one -on -one interaction, or a group experience. And this participation enhances the class grade. CTE service learning on page 23 is more than community service. Students identify an interest or a community need and then develop a project to accomplish it. The experience participation may enhance the class grade and this experience can, take, can be taken in conjunction with career and technical student organization experiences. Mentorship on page 37 allows students to participate in a long-term relationship with a professional with a proven track record who can offer first-hand experience and help them learn about a particular industry or workplace. Students may earn half a credit towards graduation with a duration of at least 140 hours. Externship is an extended job shadowing experience designed so that the student can observe, ask questions, and get a preview of day-to-day -day activities. Work is not delegated or a project assigned as in an intern experience, but with a minimum of 40 hours, the class grade can be enhanced. School-based enterprises enable students to manage a business operation that provides goods and services that meet the needs of the school's target markets. The class grade is enhanced by this experience and examples would include things like culinary cafe or ca uh, catering services, <coughs> agricultural greenhouse plant sales, child care programs, retail stores, credit union, automotive services, and carpentry services. Internship on page 67 places a student in a real world workplace and is guided by a formal training plan that specifies academic and workplace skills to be mastered. This experience can be paid or unpaid and receives a standard unit of credit for a minimum of 240 hours throughout the entire school year. Entrepreneurship allows an entrepreneurial student to develop skills necessary to become established in their own business by owning business assets and keeping financial records to determine return on investments. The class grade is enhanced by this experience. Clinical experience on page 93 is for students taking classes in the health and medical field, and they participate in a non-paid experience while observing treatment of patients at different stages of medical practice so they can gain a better understanding of the scope of the healthcare profession. Cooperative education combines a rigorous and relevant curriculum with an occupational spe specialty related to the student's interests, abilities, and goals. It is guided by, again, a formal written training plan that defines specific academic and workplace skills to be mastered, and the experience receives a standard unit of credit for a minimum of 280 hours. Youth Registered Apprenticeship on page 135 provides related CTE technical instruction is occupation specific and has worksite supervision from a skilled mentor to meet on the job requirements. All work hours are documented and can be credited toward completion of a registered apprenticeship program, which I will tell you about next. And this experience receives a standard unit of credit for a minimum of 280 hours a year. And then there's registered apprenticeship. This allows students to obtain paid work experience, occupation-specific instruction, and a portably nationally recognized credential. Experience is based on national industry standards and can be customized to the needs of the employer. Students can begin occupational education and on-the-job training while in high school. Are there any questions? I don't have a question, but just a comment. Please. Um, 
I was really, to be honest with you, blown away by this document. Uh, that uh, work that's gone into it, the quality of the forms, it, it, I was so impressed. And, you know, knowing that we have a college and career readiness indicator coming online in a couple of years, this will, this really fulfills the need that divisions have to understand the types of things they, they need to be doing and answer some of the questions that we've been receiving. So I just want to acknowledge um, the quality of this document and uh, express appreciation for all the work that went into it. Dr. Paxton. I, I certainly echo that sentiment um, as a as an employer, uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. Um, I had a very deep appreciation for the level of detail and the breadth by which the content around CTE was covered here. The various uh, uh, pipelines or work streams that are available to help us prepare our students for careers. Uh, just one question, um, just looking over the acknowledgments and recognizing the groups that were involved in providing feedback, um, unless I'm overlooking something, I didn't see a lot of employers providing any input into this. I saw the Department of Labor and Industry, which is certainly um, mm -hmm. a healthy uh, resource, but just curious around the thought of, 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 of uh, I guess, a sanity check against the uh, the, the, the field by which would benefit from this. Was there any thought about including uh, representatives from various industries on these? More than um, what was there? Well, what am I, that's what I'm asking. What, if I've overlooked, uh, either if it wasn't in the acknowledgements or, or if maybe you could help me get some perspective on. Basically, we, we had school divisions and um, people that we thought were able to emphasize what they had learned through doing some of these experience with business with and employees. industry already. And yeah. that helped us get the input we needed Yeah, because they're out there every day on the ground with them. Certainly. There's several of them listed on here that we've worked directly with yes. and provided feedback into their curriculum. So sure that connection's there. I was just curious if there was any direct, direct feedback, but that's, that's a good observation. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, sure. I just also wanted to make a comment. I've I've had school divisions routinely asking me about guidance on how they can uh, get towards uh, work-based learning in their school divisions. And I, when I first saw this document in F form earlier, like Diane uh, or Miss Atkinson, I was I was blown away. And so I just want to thank you guys for your work on this. And and I I, I will say let. I'm going to do this anyways, but let me know how I can help so support you in making sure it gets out there broadly to, to everyone. All right. Thank you. The board will receive this for first review also. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Okay. We'll do item J and then we'll take the break if that meets everybody's approval. Uh, first review of the proposed revisions to health education standards of learning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Let's see. President Gecker, Vice President Atkinson, members of the board, Dr. Lane, I appreciate the opportunity to present for first review the proposed revisions to the health education standards of learning. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Liz Payne from Fairfax County Public Schools and Sheila Jones from Virginia Beach City Public Schools as they spent countless hours facilitating the review and all of the other subject matter experts whose contributions played a significant role in the proposed standards. The proposed changes also reflect extensive public input from teachers, administrators, curriculum supervisors, and the general public and include legislative action taken by the 2018 and 2019 General Assembly that directs the Board of Education to review the health education standards of learning and incorporate standards that recognize the health and safety risks associated with nicotine vapored products and the multiple dimensions of health by including mental health. In an effort to maximize public comment and structure the health SOLs to better support instruction, 
the standards were divided into the following topics, body systems, nutrition, physical health, disease prevention and health promotion, substance abuse prevention, safety and injury prevention, mental wellness and social and emotional skills, violence prevention, and community and environmental health. We then convened a series of meetings with mental and behavioral health, substance abuse prevention, nutrition, and public health subject matter experts who reviewed each topic using a holistic whole child approach to learning. And they in turn provided extensive input that significantly informed the proposed changes to the standards. The recommendations from the subject matter experts and input from public comment was then shared with the SOL review committee that met for three days and consisted of health educators, division supervisors, a high school administrator, higher education, and behavioral and public health subject matter experts. Collectively, the, SO, the SOL review committee proposed the revisions to the health education standards of learning found in attachments A and B that reflect changes in state law, public input, and current research on effective practice and includes scaffolding health skills to be developmentally appropriate across grade levels and explicit of what students should know, understand, and be able to do, reorganizing health content and skills by topic in each strand to show vertical alignment and to support teacher instruction and student learning by focusing on the importance of obtaining and maintaining physical, mental, social, and emotional health, increasing understanding of mental illnesses, challenges, and treatments, decreasing stigma related to mental health, enhancing help seeking efficacy and promoting self-care, adding content and skills related to preventing vaping and opioid use, and including positive norm settings for substance use, supporting the development of essential questions, skills-based instruction, and deeper learning, and explicitly integrating the five Cs, providing opportunities to explore health careers and job opportunities, and acquiring essential skills to manage the health challenges facing today's youth with the ultimate goal for every child to live a healthy life. The superintendent of public instruction recommends that the board receive for first review the proposed revisions to the health education standards of learning. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? No question, but just a comment. Please. Yeah, Vanessa, thank you for your hard work on this. As you heard in the comments this thank morning, you, uh, you uh, uh, as it was clear to us in the comments this morning, you've done phenomenal work helping um, uh, bring a variety of expert advice to bear on this hard work, and it looks like a great product. I do believe we will be holding some public hearings around the Commonwealth. This is important work, and uh, we invite the public's feedback on the great work you've done. Help us make it even better, public, please. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, having this actually start impacting what we're doing in the classrooms soon. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I, I am, we are certainly mindful that we have people in the audience waiting for item K. I, I don't really want to delay it. On the other hand, I don't know how long it's gonna take the board and therefore we're gonna take the break now with no disrespect to y'all, and uh, we will be back in 10 minutes. <laughs>
Second session, uh, item K, first review of 2019-2020 accreditation appeals for Bristol City and Fairfax County. Ah, I just need to look in front of me, don't I? <laughs> Uh, good morning, President Gecker, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. Item K in your board book is first review of accreditation appeals for the 2019-2020 accreditation cycle. I'm presenting to you today four appeals, Virginia Middle School in Bristol City, Fort Belvoir Elementary, Justice High School, and Mount Vernon High School in Fairfax County. Section 131-380. Dot F.6 dot of the standards of accreditation requires the board to provide a process for local school boards to appeal the performance level of any school quality indicator for any school in the division. The SOA goes on to say that appeals should be granted only in limited circumstances that warrant special consideration. The department distributed appeal applications to school divisions in late July following the preliminary release of state accreditation results. In the application, the department described the intent of the appeal provision in the SOA as providing potential relief to school divisions, to schools, excuse me, that have experienced a significant event impacting performance on an indicator. Such circumstances should be unusual and appeals based on this section of the SOA should be rare. The department established a seven-person committee to review each appeal application with representation from research and data, accountability, assessment, federal programs, special education, and policy. The committee reviewed each appeal application, also included as attachments A through D of the board item. The committee also reviewed additional accreditation data on the school and the appealed indicator, summaries of which are included in attachments E through H of the board item. The committee made a recommendation to the superintendent based on the information available. I will go through each appeal briefly. Uh, Virginia Middle School in Bristol City is appealing the Achievement Gap English Indicator, and their application focuses specifically on the improvement in the failure rate for students with disabilities. As a reminder, the failure rate is defined as the percent of students failing the state assessment and is calculated as the number of students failing divided by the number of students tested. If a student group improves the failure rate by 10% or more compared to the previous year, they are eligible to receive a bump in their performance level from level three to level two or from level two to level one, for example. The department's failure rate calculation for this indicator and this student group is displayed in the second table of attachment E. Per the department's calculation, students with disabilities reduce their failure rate by 5.65% short of the 10% threshold required to receive a performance level bump. The application for Virginia Middle School suggests a modified calculation. From the count of failing students in the numerator, it subtracts failing students who show growth or progress. It then also subtracts the students who pass the test with recovery. These students did not fail the test, so the rationale for subtracting them is not clear. The appeals committee reviewed the application for Virginia Middle and found no single significant event or circumstance impacting the indicator, as is the intent of the appeal provision. In addition, the committee believed that the failure rate as currently defined aligns with the board's intent. After reviewing the committee's findings, Superintendent Lane recommends to the board to deny the appeal. The next appeal is for Fort Belvoir Elementary in Fairfax County, appealing the Achievement Gap English Indicator. Their application is included as attachment B of the board item. Fort Belvoir is a K through three elementary school and is located on a military installation. The appeal application described the school's grade structure and the high level of student need as barriers to English performance. Historical data available on the English achievement gap indicator is included in attachment F. The school was established as a K-3 school beginning in 2017, so there are only three years of data available for this school. The Appeals Committee reviewed the application for Fort Belvoir Elementary and found no single significant event or circumstance impacting the indicator, as is the intent of the appeal provision. In addition, the committee recognized that school grade structure could be addressed locally if it is a barrier to student success. After reviewing the committee's findings, Superintendent Lane recommends to the board to deny the appeal. The next appeal is for Justice High School in Fairfax County. Appealing the dropout indicator, the appeal application included in the board item as attachment C, 
describes the characteristics of student dropouts at Justice High School, typically older students with limited English proficiency, newly arriving to the country, and with limited and or interrupted formal education. Historical data on the dropout rate at Justice High School is included as attachment G. The dropout rate has decreased from a high of 16.10% in 2016 to a low of 11.18% in 2018, increasing just slightly to 11.49% in 2019. The Appeals Committee reviewed the application for Justice High School and found no single significant event or circumstance impacting the indicator, as is the intent of the appeal provision. In addition, the committee believes that serving students with high needs in and of itself is not sufficient rationale for an appeal. After reviewing the committee's findings, Superintendent Lane recommends to the board to deny the appeal. The final appeal is for Mount Vernon High School in Fairfax County, also appealing the dropout indicator. The appeal application included as attachment D to the board item describes dropouts as typically English learners who are eligible for free and reduced price meals and who are 18 or older at the time of withdrawal. Historical data on the dropout rate at Mount Vernon High School is included as attachment H. The dropout rate has remained above 11% since 2017. The Appeals Committee reviewed the application for Mount Vernon High School and found no single significant event or circumstance impacting the indicator, as is the intent of the appeal provision. In addition, the committee believes that serving students with high needs in and of itself is not sufficient rationale for an appeal. After reviewing the committee's findings, Superintendent Lane recommends to the board to deny the appeal. In conclusion, the Superintendent of Public Re Instruction requests the board waive first review and approve the Superintendent's recommendations for each appeal. And I'll read them again. The Superintendent recommends the following actions. Deny the appeal for Virginia Middle School in Bristol City. Deny the appeal for Fort Belvoir Elementary in Fairfax County. Deny the appeal for Justice High School in Fairfax County. And deny the appeal for Mount Vernon High School in Fairfax County. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in terms of process, we will take them up one at a time. I understand, again, uh, Ms. davis Vaught is going to recuse from Virginia Middle School in Bristol. Uh, are there any comments by the board or questions from the board with regard to uh, oh, any of them? But let's start with Virginia Middle. See any questions? I don't see any comments. Is there a motion with regard then to the Virginia Middle School appeal? Yes. Second. Yeah, I guess the motion is to uh, motion to deny. Deny the appeal. Ms. Atkinson, second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Um, Mr. Gecker, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is uh, technically a, a comment on the motion itself, but rather on the uh, comment or the question that was raised through public comment. Um, the superintendent in Bristol City, um, Dr. Perigen, mentioned the uh, calculation that's used and uh, perhaps an imbalance and how we apply mm -hmm. uh, certain variables. And so I wonder from staff's perspective if that's something that you have considered having seen this comment mm -hmm. and what a response might be as we move forward. Sure. Um, so there are, there are really two parts of the appeal that um, I'd like to, or a part of the calculation that I'd like to address separately. The first is uh, students who fail but show growth or recovery. Um, those students are currently count, counted as fails, uh, if they fail, in the failure rate. Uh, the calculation that um, the Bristol City has put forth removes them from the failure rate calculation, so essentially um, treats them differently than other students who fail. That it could be considered what we have uh, shorthanded referred to as an inverse of the combined rate. It is essentially students who um, have failed outright but have not shown growth and progress. 
Uh, we have received feedback from superintendents, not just in Bristol, but in other places as well, about whether there is a benefit for the department to consider a change in the calculation to the failure rate um, to move towards something that would be the inverse of the combined rate. Uh, when we've modeled this data, there is not a universal benefit. And the primary reason for that is because uh, the failure rate, depending on the number of students who fail with no growth versus those that fail uh, with growth, with progress and recovery, the calculations can vary in terms of their um, overall benefit and whether or not they put schools above or below that 10%. So really the change when we modeled it to summarize to the inverse of the combined rate was a bit of a wash, if you will. Some schools benefited, some schools did not. The second part of the calculation that is proposed here in terms of moving or subtracting students who show growth is a little more difficult for us to understand and justify, I believe. Um, those students are not in the numerator. They are, they are passing students, and so they are not counted in the failure rate currently. And so it doesn't seem to me as if there would be a sufficient rationale for adjusting the calculation to remove those students who are not already in the calculation. Anybody, anybody else? No, Ms. Holton. Just by way of comment, we, we did hear from uh, the uh, Dr. Perigen, thank you, and, and others this morning, a, a, a number referred to being accredited with conditions as being penalized, and I just, I understand that it feels that way. <clears throat> I just want to reiterate that it's certainly our intention with the current um, SOA that being accredited with conditions is not uh, uh, considered a punitive status. Unlike the prior accredited with warning, we do not mean it to be a negative label. We mean it to be uh, an identification of schools that need more oversight and support. Uh, and I guess that was the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I wanted to say is I did want to recognize the good hard work, regardless of how rule on this um, uh, appeal, the good hard work going on at, the, mm -hmm. at Virginia Middle School and the progress being made. And if I understood correctly, and this I will phrase as a question, Jen, am I right that uh, they were close to, meet, to meeting um, the mark uh, on the growth? Yes, they, so they, the, uh, the Students with Disabilities group at Virginia Middle has seen improvement in recent years. It was not sufficient enough to get them the bump in performance that they're looking for, but they have shown growth, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Atkinson. Um, yesterday, during the Committee on School and Division Accountability, mm -hmm. one of the things that we discussed and authorized is that we will be opening we'll be presented with the opportunity to provide a NOR in November, I believe, uh, that would open the SOA to, to look at uh, tweaking some things that have come to our attention, recognizing that while we had hoped that we had identified all the unintended consequences of things that um, we were doing through the SOA. So, there's an opportunity to look at things like this. So I just want to say it's it's harder to do an appeal or grant the appeal. But I think, you know, as, as a board, um, I would suggest we look at this, you know, and then make a decision whether to change the rule globally um, through that process. And uh, Mr. Gecker, Please, yeah. the, the only clarification I had, Ms. Atkinson, was uh, we do plan to bring the NORA in March. I'm sorry. But but yes yes we do we do plan to and 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 certainly that that was maybe one thing that Jen somewhat alluded to but uh, as we look at what's required in the standards accreditation or the guidelines we feel like as we ruled on the appeals we were ruling at with what's written that doesn't mean that we can't look at standards of accreditation adjustments through the regulatory process that could later make some of these possible for us to to recommend on. Anybody else? I mean, I certainly would echo uh, Ms. Holton's comments that we appreciate, number one, y'all being here. Number two, really just the clear desire to do right by the children in the, in the school division. And, uh, you know, we walk a tightrope. You know, you've seen it before in some of the appeals we've had in years past. You know, I think the board understands the potential 
negative impact of a rating other than fully accredited. And uh, on the other hand, we have certain mandates and certain responsibility to maintain the integrity of the accountability system so that it's you know useful statewide and also provide some incentive to keep that improvement going. And so none of what happens here today should be taken as anything other than, uh, you know, there's a system in place. We believe in the in, in that system. Uh, as you, you may have heard, you know, our next work plan item, if you follow our comprehensive work plan, is to look again at, you know, what does the system of accreditation do to schools? You know, what we've had 20 plus years of it now, you know, in one form or another, although I know I recognize the new system has got some significant changes, but we've been accrediting schools, uh, you know, in such a way as to label them either better or worse, in a sense, for quite some time. And there is no doubt that that labeling system uh, has had some adverse impact on uh, communities, in particular schools. And I think we will take a serious look at that as we move forward. Uh, with that being said, are there any other comments? If not, we'll call the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, which is to deny the appeal, signify by saying aye. Uh, any opposed and one recusal okay uh number two fort belvoir i guess everybody's fully participating in this uh, are there any questions with regard to fort belvoir seeing none i guess uh is there a motion with regard to the appeal on fort belvoir There is a second to that motion. Okay. Any discussion? And again, the comments just made with regard to Virginia Middle. Uh, again, we understand the great work going on, and understand these, uh, you know, special circumstances there. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, no discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Justice High School, are there any questions there? Please. Um, again, thank you all for being here. And the comments that we heard this morning and uh, the public comment spoke to the demographic of the school and the challenges that that demographic is facing. I think to iterate um, Dr. Pavarena's comment that while the demographic is challenging, it is not an unusual, defined unusual circumstance, meaning this is not a phenomenon that has recently occurred, but one that we have seen over time. So I do think that that is um, worth iterating again um, with regard to the rationale um, for this recommendation. Okay. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, following up, thank you, Doctor, on, on Dr. Wilson's point, uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out how unusual is it to have that many, not just ELL students, but uh, I think the point that was made fairly effectively about the students with interrupted formal education, that 90%, 92 percent of the SIFE stu students at Justice dropped out last year, 100 percent of the uh, comparable students at Mount Vernon dropped out. Uh, uh, is that an unusual, having that number of, and it's having maybe something to do with the affordable housing in the, in the whole region and in that area, mm -hmm. why they're attracting those students? I'd hate to have a school be incentivized to not open their arms to those students. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, um, uh, on the one hand, this is something I'd like to put a marker down to have us think about as mm -hmm. we do the SOA revisions, mm -hmm. um, specifically with respect to the dropout measure. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not so applicable to the other measures, mm -hmm. but specifically with respect to the dropout measure. Um, and, and second, my question is, do we know, are there other schools with a high percentage of SIFE, what, what Fairfax mm -hmm. is describing as SIFE students? Um, and do we know what their status was with respect to... Mm -hmm the dropout measure this year? 
Yeah. So as, as Dr. Braben mentioned in his comments this morning, the state does not collect information on SIFE students. And so we do not have any visibility statewide about whether any other schools are struggling with this. Although we've certainly heard anecdotally in, in counties outside of Fairfax that this is an issue. Um, we do have uh, data to suggest that certainly, um, even if you look at the state level rates of dropout for English learners, that there is a significant issue statewide um, with these students in terms of being able to maintain their enrollment. But I don't have specific information about other high schools that are struggling with that. Yeah, and and now, uh, you know, simply a high level of English language learners is a different matter to me. You know, we expect our schools to, and, and they do rise to the challenge, including these schools, to help meet the needs of our English language learners. And, um, and we hold them accountable for those, achieve, for those gaps um, mm -hmm. for, for the right reason. Uh, but this particular challenge of dropouts with students who are there for a short duration um, and maybe um, uh, effectively on their own, um, uh, dropping out to support themselves, uh, I, I, that was persuasive to me. Another thing that was persuasive to me that I'd, I'd appreciate your reaction to, just looking at this uh, justice, you know, they've dropped the, the dropout rate uh, by really almost 30% over several years. Help me understand how, you, so our, our um, improvement metrics, in other words, if you make a big drop one year and then you hold level the next year, that's a success. Mm -hmm. um, um, but do, do our metrics take that into account? Is this a rolling averagey kind of thing? Or do you somehow get credit for the fact that you had a big drop some years ago or, or not in our current calculations? So we, the dropout rate that we include in state accreditation is a cohort measure, um, meaning that it is calculated on the graduating class of a given year. Um, we do allow schools to uh, meet the benchmark on either a current year cohort or a three-year uh, cumulative cohort for, for a dropout. Um, and so if they had um, a drop within the last few years that might be picked up in their, in their three-year rate. Um, the dropout indicator, as with other indicators, also has an opportunity for schools to get a bump in performance if they show a level of improvement. Um, so if they have a drop uh, within one year, so from the previous year to the current year, they would be eligible for a, a bump up in their performance levels. But it's a one year only, we only do a one year look back on the growth measure. Yes, that's so correct. So you, whether you meet the benchmark or not, whether you meet the defined level or not is a three year thing, but whether you make them, whether you, we acknowledge movement, that's a one year look back. Yes, ma'am. Um, and can you remind me what the levels, what, what are the dropout levels sure. for level one and level two? Yes. So uh, a level one uh, dropout would be 6% or less. Level two is greater than 6%, but less than 9%. And level three is 9% or higher. And then to reduce, uh, to, to get, uh, to be recognized as level two based on your growth, mm -hmm. what percentage of reduction of your dropout rate do you have to achieve? It's a 10% reduction. So if you were at an 11%, uh, then you'd oh, have to reduce... 1.1%. Right, right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if you were at 16 and you came down one or two points every year steadily, then mm -hmm. you would be counted as level two based on that steady improvement. But if you drop down a whole lot and then stay steady at that lower level... Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Is there a motion, I guess, with regard to Justice High School? Motion to deny the appeal. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? So none all in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any Nay. Nay. Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. Mount Vernon? <coughs> Any questions there? I'll just make the same argument that I did, or raise the same issues with respect to Mount Vernon, and I think the data is similar. Okay, is there a motion? Motion to deny. Okay, from Ms. Atkinson, a motion to deny. Is there a second? Thank you, Dr. Mann. Uh, any discussion? Seeing that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. 
You were nay? I was a nay on the other as well. Oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. That too. okay. Uh, any abstentions? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Item L, first review of the advisory board on teacher education and licensure's recommendations to establish uh, dual language endorsements. Ms. Pitts, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Kecker, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. It's certainly my pleasure to present to you a recommendation from Abtel to establish a dual language endorsement in the licensure regulations. <coughs> In 2018, the Virginia General Assembly passed House Bill 1156, requiring the establishment of an endorsement in dual language instruction pre-K through six in the lic licensure regulations. The leg legislation stated that the teacher seeking an initial license will be exempted from the Virginia Communication and Literacy Assessment. To begin this process, the Board of Education approved a notice um, to um, was approved in, in October of 2018 to begin the process um, to create this endorsement. Dual language is when students are taught literacy and content in two languages. For example, English and Spanish or English and French. A dual language endorsement workshop, um, work group was established and the group of stakeholders was held on March 25th, and a second meeting was held on June 17th. The list of the members of the work group is in your packet. I do want to call your attention to two members of the work group, specifically um, Dr. Lisa Harris, who is our specialist in world languages and international education, and Jessica Costa, the specialist for English learner instruction, who assisted me in coordinating the development of the recommendations. The work group made recommendations for new and add-on endorsements in dual language English pre-K through six and dual language target language pre-K through six. Target language means the foreign language in which the individual or the world language that would be shown on the endorsement. On September 23rd, recommendations were submitted to Abtel and Dr. Lisa Harris also attended that meeting to provide additional context to the advisory board. You have the recommendation from Abtel, the specific text and language for these endorsements. Just want to call your attention to a couple of items that are listed. For the dual language English endorsement pre-K through six, a statement is included that individuals who hold a valid Virginia teaching license with an elementary education endorsement may teach in dual language English in the corresponding grade levels listed on the license. The, these endorsement requirements for the English endorsement, dual language English endorsement pre-K through six are aligned with the current requirements for elementary education currently in your regulations. The dual language target language pre-K through six endorsement is to teach dual language in a world language other than English. And as I noted, the target language will be noted on the endorsement. For this particular endorsement, the individual must complete 12 semester hours in the target language above the intermediate level, which would equate to about 24 semester hours or have a major in the target language or meet a qualifying score in the foreign language assessment in the target language as prescribed by the board. And we currently use the Praxis assessment as well as the ACTFL assessment. And individuals have to meet specified content coursework. The proposed licensure requirements are provided in the attached board item and they will be subject to the Standard Administrative Process Act, which will include public comment. The Superintendent of Public Instruction recommends that the Board of Education receive for first review Aptel's recommendation to establish dual language endorsements in the licensure regulations for school personnel in response to the 2018 General Assembly legislation. Thank you. Are there any questions? Just a general Please. question. Of course. So sometimes 
So will we need to make changes to our teacher prep program regs as a result as well? Okay. Yes. In fact, today you approved in, cons in consent a NORA notice of intended regulatory action to for this endorsement as well as economics and personal finance so we can move forward. The legislation really only refers to the licensure regulations, which was a little bit interesting, but we noticed later that we also needed to expand that to the approved program regulations. And this group has already made recommendations um, regarding those competencies as well. Thank you. Is there a reason for this to come back? The only reason would be if anyone in the public would have any comment regarding the recommendations of Abtel. However, during the Administrative Process Act, there will be plenty of opportunities for public comment. Yes, I'm looking at the, what the process and wondering, I mean, do you feel that we've had enough opportunity for public? I don't, I don't mind carrying it to the next month. I just, looking at where this process is going to go, unlike something we just do here, it's going to have a pretty substantial comment period. We certainly had a um, work group that encompassed the major associations in Virginia, as well as individuals who were working with, um, who work in the dual language um, area. So, and also we had um, um, people in the department who had reached out to others. So I'm not sure whether people would comment, but certainly they can comment during the Administrative Process Act as we move forward. It will go on through the standard process, so it will be the longer process, not a shortened version of the APA. I'm looking at this more carefully now. I guess September 23rd, so the they have not really been published in form for very long. Yeah, we'll, we'll move it. We'll just accept it for first review. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, item M, first review of Abtel's. Yeah. Recommendation for the guidelines for alternate routes to licensure in response to House Bill 2486. The Department of Education established a work group on August 27, 2019 to recommend to the Board of Education guidelines for alternate routes to licensure in response to House Bill 2486 of the 2019 Virginia General Assembly. The Board of Education is required by the legislation to develop guidelines no later than December 1, 2019. To give you some context um, to why legislation was prompted in this area, there were conversations about um, other types of programs such as Montessori instruction um, being allowed as a part of an alternate route to a program and there are other program providers that expressed interest in submitting possibly other routes to licensure in Virginia. Therefore, the legislation was adopted. And we have worked um, with this work group and you have the um, list of the work group in your packet so you can see who participated. But Abtel reviewed the recommendations of the work group September 23rd, 2019. Abtel reviewed the report and recommended a few revisions which you have in your proposal. Did want to call your attention to the fact that all proposals must be submitted by a school board or an organization sponsored by a school board. The guidelines propose that the board would need to approve programs initially for three years and renewed for seven years. Since you have the specific guidelines in your packet, I certainly will not go through those, but you can see that they're very detailed. The process for submission includes um, much detail before that can be submitted to the board for review. The superintendent of public instruction recommends the Board of Education receive for first review the guidelines for alternate routes to licensure in response to House Bill 2486 of the 2019 Virginia General Assembly. Okay, any questions or comments? No, and we will receive that on first review. Thank you. Item N, 
first review of proposed revisions to the guidelines for uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers, principals, and superintendents. As you're aware, state law requires that teacher, principal, and superintendent evaluations must be consistent with the Board of Education performance standards included in the guidelines for uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers, principals, and superintendents. Also, evaluations must include student academic progress as a significant component and include an overall summative rating. Teacher evaluations must include regular observation and evidence that instruction is aligned with the school's curric curriculum. Evaluations must include identification of areas of individual strengths and weaknesses and recommendations for appropriate professional activities. As you're aware, and as you discussed yesterday, a process is a beginning to review and make revisions to the guidelines for uniform performance standards for teachers, principals, and superintendents. Prior to the broader review, revised guidelines are being presented to the Board of Education to address only the weighting of the performance standards for the evaluation of teachers, principals, and superintendents. <coughs> In 2012, in response to federal reporting requirements pursuant to state fiscal stabilization fund and to meet requirements of Virginia's Elementary and Secondary Education Act flexibility plan, Virginia was required to ensure that student academic progress, which is standard seven, accounted for 40% of the summative evaluation for teachers. The board's current guidelines call for the first six standards to be weighted equally at 10% each and the seventh standard student academic progress to account for 40% of the summative evaluation. Since the federal reporting requirement has been eliminated, these percentages are no longer mandated. The attached guidelines propose that the evaluation of student academic progress is met if performance standard seven, student academic progress is not the least weighted of the performance standards or less than one, 10%. However, it may be weighted equally as one of the multiple lowest weighted standards. The guidelines recommend the following weighted weighting for performance evaluations. For standards one through five, the weighting would be 1.5, standard six, one, and standard seven, student academic progress, 1.5. You have the performance evaluation, the guidelines for both teachers, principals, and superintendents that reflect these revisions. The Superintendent of Public Instruction recommends the Board of Education receive for first review revised guidelines for uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers, principals, and superintendents. Okay, are there any questions on this? <clears throat> Don't see any. So we will accept this for first review. Thank you. Thank you. Item O, first review of report from APTEL uh, on recommendations for dual enrollment in, in response to Senate Bill 1575. You have in your board item, APTEL's report on dual enrollment in response to Senate Bill 1575 of the 2019 Virginia General Assembly. As required by the legislation, APTEL is recommending qualifications for dual enrollment instructors employed by in an institution of higher education to teach in the public schools. Just to provide a little context um, regarding this legislation, for some school divisions offering dual enrollment, employing their own teachers who meet the qualifications for dual enrollment is challenging. Therefore, when some school divisions employ faculty from higher education who are not licensed by the Board of Education, then they employ another teacher to be in the classroom who is licensed, therefore having two teachers in the same dual enrollment classroom. School divisions have expressed that in most cases, they would prefer to have their own teachers who qualify to teach dual enrollment teach these classes. One of the challenges is 
that faculty who teach dual enrollment must meet requirements from SAC COC, which is the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. And individuals who are teaching most of these courses must have a master's or doctorate degree and 18 semester hours of graduate work in the content area. So that is a challenge. So the legislation recommended or required that the department or the board create a license, which we did, it's, it's in place now, but it is only effective until 2021, that would allow faculty members to obtain a license for three years to teach dual enrollment courses. We're calling the license the Career and Technical Education and Dual Enrollment License. No one has requested it to date, but it is in place if a school division does that. But this was just a stopgap, which will expire 2021. Therefore, Aptel is making recommendations regarding dual enrollment and a work group was established to make recommendations to Aptel and then Aptel is making recommendations to you first. And then the report will go to the chairman of the House Committee on Education and Senate Committee on Education and Health and it is due by December 1. Aptel is recommending the following. To increase the pipeline of teachers qualified to teach dual enrollment cor courses by encouraging additional funding for incentives for K through 12 teachers to meet current requirements for high, higher education dual enrollment eligibility requirements. They're also encouraging accredited institutions of higher education to offer the graduate content courses to assist individuals in meeting qualifications to teach dual enrollment. Further discussion regarding the criteria used to determine K-12 teacher eligibility to teach dual enrollment courses for college credit needs to be, we need to engage in that further discussion. There's also a request for the Board of Education to establish not a three-year, but a one-year non-renewable dual enrollment license. The reason for that is that school division representatives on the work group and Abtel agreed that it would be better to issue these, li these licenses once um, on a yearly basis instead of three years because many times they are hiring these individuals for only one year. And, it, and this license is recommended by a school superintendent. So if a school superintendent wants to hire a dual enrollment teacher for one year, only for that one year, then the preference is that they not have a license for three years and can use that in other divisions where a superintendent has not made the specific recommendation. So under the one year license, which we would need to bring to the board to create, an extension of the license would be made annually. The superintendent of public instruction recommends that the board of education receive a first review Aptel's report on dual enrollment, including career and technical education, in response to Senate Bill 1575 of the 2019 Virginia General Assembly. Okay, are there any questions or comments, please? Patty, thank you. Um, so the rationale for reducing the length of the license from three years to one year, I heard you say uh, we'd, we would not necessarily want an individual to have a license that uh, a receiving superintendent has not advocated for, but would the standard for the license not be consistent across the Commonwealth, just as other licenses are? The requirements would be the same. There would be no different in the qualifications to receive it, other than one of the requirements is that the superintendent needs to make that recommendation for the individual to receive this license. So the concern was if someone is teaching in a particular school division and perhaps that school division, it didn't work out, um, then that individual wouldn't have a license to take to another school. That superintendent would have to submit the request for the extension of the license. I'm sorry, one follow-on question. Sure. So does that mean that, uh, so for these, these are basically college faculty, 
right? Yes. Yes. Um, so that would mean that uh, a, in a region like this, where you have neighboring school divisions, mm -hmm. one uh, faculty member could not then teach across different school divisions. Is that right? So if I'm teaching college comp, I couldn't teach a section in Henrico and then go teach a section in Chesterfield or Hanover because of, uh, is that correct? He or she could. So if an individual had the one year license, he or she could teach in multiple school divisions in that During year. During that year. Right. And those school divisions would make the decision regarding the employment of that individual for that year. Interesting. Yes. Anybody else? Please. I, uh, board members, you can probably tell that uh, Patty managed eight items this month on the board agenda. <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever had a staff member had to do that many at once. And I just, I, in addition to the team that did the accreditation appeals, just want to thank you. I, you can see how much goes into each report, including uh, item Q, which is just a written report. So I just want to thank you for your work on all of this. You're very welcome. Okay. Anybody else? If not, we will accept this for first review also. Thank you very much. Item P, review the board's uh, annual report. Good morning, President Gecker, members of the board, and Dr. Lane. I'm pleased to present for first review the board's 2019 annual report on the condition and needs of public schools in Virginia. As you will note in your boilerplate, this report is a requirement of the Code of Virginia. This section outlines the requirements of the report, including the current standards of quality, information on student and parent choice, including charter school and virtual school options, as well as a report of the reports that local school divisions are required to submit to the state or federal government. I will note that many of these reports are still being finalized, so you don't see them uh, in your current draft, but they will be included in the appendices of the November board item. The annual report presents the needs of public education in Virginia, an update on the board's work over the past year on the SOQ revisions, and a summary of achievement of schools and students. The current draft does not reflect the edits discussed during yesterday's work session. More data will be added on teacher vacancies. A full executive summary that includes the board accomplishments will be included and te other technical edits will be made for final review. The superintendent of public instruction recommends that the board receive for first review the 2019 on the annual report on the condition and needs of public schools in Virginia. Okay, are there any comments here? Yeah. I just want to acknowledge for the public that we we worked on this yesterday yes, in work session. Mm -hmm. So while we may not have comments, <laughs> we had many comments yesterday yes. as we walked through this document. And, and want to thank Emily for her work. Thank you. If um, as you all continue to dig into it, if there are any you know additional comments over the next week or so that you have, um, Mrs. Atkinson handed me a couple of edits yesterday. Please feel free to email those to me. I'll be working on it over the next week as we prepare for the November meeting. So happy to yeah. receive those. And, yeah, we ought to be mindful that making the annual report is in fact a constitutional requirement imposed upon the board. And it is one of those documents that uh, you know, board members are entitled to and should use when people ask what the board's position is on certain items. You know, we've uh, talked about the comprehensive work plan in the same way. This is not just a routine document, and so it would be appreciated. And this message is for me also. It was, you know, sort of t tied up in the SOQs for months. Uh, but a good review of the annual report would be very helpful before the November meeting. And as Emily said, to the extent we can get comments in early, yeah. it'd be greatly appreciated. Drafting by committee is a very difficult and painful process, as we've seen at different times. So, uh, again, this is not just a routine transmittal. This is, in fact, a statement of uh, the policies and work of this board. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, two written reports. Are there any comments there? Items Q and R, and then discussion of current issues. Anybody have anything that uh, they want to talk about today? Uh, comment. I was 
pleased to be um, at the Virginia Teacher of the Year uh, celebration a couple weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Gecker brought remarks on behalf of the board. Ms. Atkinson was there and Dr. Lane emceed the evening. And uh, Dr. Lane, I don't know if you want to talk about the Teacher of the Year. Uh, good idea. Yeah. And did you replace the apple? <laughs> <laughs> and you can explain that if you want. Uh, give, give me one second. I, um, the, the teacher of the year is uh, a teacher out of Salem uh, uh, in, in, in Region 6. And it, it was a great event. The governor was able to attend this year. Uh, the, uh, the first lady was there. And, and, and uh, yes, I, uh, I had the opportunity of, uh, of recognizing Andrea that evening. But we had, we had eight great uh, regional winners uh, in, in each of our regions. Uh, we had um, surprise announcements, uh, and, and uh, I was able to attend Region 8. I know the, the First Lady was, I think, up in Northern Virginia. Uh, but, uh, yes, at, at that event, we did name Andrea uh, Carson Johnson from Salem, who's a, a high school English teacher as the Virginia Teacher of the Year. And uh, Rodney Robinson was there to join us as well. We, we thanked him for his service as the Virginia Teacher of the Year for the, the past year. He will continue to serve as the National Teacher of the Year until that term expires and are uh, so excited for Andrea and Salem. I think uh, at least in the last decade, this is the second teacher out of Salem that has won that, has won that distinction. Like three or four years, three years yeah, yeah, I think 15 or 16, yeah. So uh, excited for them, and uh, congrats to Andrea, and congrats to Salem. Thanks for mentioning that. Please, of course. I had the honor of serving on that panel, and one of the things that you get when you serve on that panel is you actually get a packet on each of the individuals. So you all see them, but I, I had the honor to read about each of them, and I, I'd like to sort of just highlight a couple of things. For each of those teachers, what struck me more than anything else was not only were they you know, incredible teachers in the classrooms. They work collaboratively to enhance their colleagues. And um, the other thing that about it was there were letters of recommendation and support and each had letters from students in their packet. And for me, that was probably the most heartwarming aspect of it all to hear from those students the impact that those individuals have made on their lives. And um, each of them was quite uh, um, accomplished, and it really, um, I, I, yeah, I know we will. They will come before us, and we will recognize them here. But it is always a wonderful opportunity to recognize the wonderful teachers that we have in this Commonwealth. And so, it was a great evening. Yes, ma'am. President Gecker, I had the pleasure to attend the ARCC meeting in Virginia Beach on September 23rd and 24th. And I'm very happy to tell everyone I, I rubbed elbows with uh, board presidents from several different states and was able to talk to them about the, the, the goals that they are doing for their areas and able to learn a little bit more about what it is that their goals were. And I'm happy to say I'm very proud to be a member of the Virginia Board and to be able to, to represent not only the board, but the state of Virginia and the teachers and the students because we have so many wonderful things going for us. I was able to meet Lieutenant, retired Lieutenant Colonel Consuelo Kickbush and hear her story as uh, she rose from a, a migrant family to becoming an, a, a naturalized citizen of the United States and all of the members in her family, I think there were nine who were in military service, and now she is going around the country as a motivational speaker for children to overcome the conditions of poverty. And it was very heartwarming and very pleasurable for me to take part in that, and I thank you for that experience. Anybody else? If not, shockingly, after the number of items on the agenda, we are in fact adjourned. We'll see you next month. It's amazing. <laughs>